Hello and welcome to the show. For today's challenge, we were on Forza 7, going to have a go at some Lucky Dip Racing. Now, we have done this uh, event in the past on previous Forza games and has always turned out to be an awful lot of fun. The way it works is every player in the lobby is randomly assigned a car within a specific class. For the sake of this race, we were using C class. There was another race we did with B class, but the replay is completely balked and can't use, so we only have one race for this but it was still a pretty damn good race nevertheless so yeah every player was drawn a random car from c class now to make my life extra difficult the <laughs> website that i use to draw the cars randomly kudos prime has got a big database of four to seven cars that uses the vehicle's homologated pi rather than the car's base pi now i don't want to be running homologated cars where often vehicles will be built to similar classes and similar specs and so on i want to be using cars standard as they come which was yeah, a lot more difficult. I kind of had to go through multiple cars until we got to one that standard was in the right class. It was awkward and fiddly. Either way, we got there. If anyone knows of a big database that you can randomise and randomly pick a car from that has them sorted by their base PI, please do let me know. It'd be really bloody helpful. But uh, there we go. Now, of course, naturally this means that cars are going to be picked out from all over C-Class, some lower, some higher PI, to try and get a little semblance of balance. Vehicles are sorted on the grid in reverse PI order, with a one-second roll-off delay between each vehicle. Now, that might not make a huge difference between two cars that are side-by-side -side on the grid, but the lowest PI car might have a 20-24 second head start on the highest PI car. And with a lot of traffic to try and get through for the faster cars, the lower PI vehicles have often done quite well here. Uh, we start on board with midfield contender the Porsche 944 following a very, very wobbly Ford Fairlane Thunderbolt. Didn't realise just how wobbly, just how jellified really the suspension on that uh, Thunderbolt was as uh, the Porsche continues to try and look for a way past. And while it is very, very difficult to get through the corners, the Ford very, very fast indeed when it comes to the straights. At the front of the field, a Mercedes 190E was the lowest PI car in the race, and they would lead the way on this opening lap. Lancia 037, another low PI car here. We know how good the 037s can be when modified and so on, but a fairly low starting PI was in second. And again, pushed very, very hard, trying to find a way past the Lancia. Went for a little trip on the grass. The top four, though, were really pulling away on this opening lap. They were able to uh, make a gap to the rest of the field, an Audi Q7 helping hold up some cars, and this little group helping hold up others. Super Impreza had made its way past the SUVs. A large number, an extra large number of SUVs have been drawn in this particular race. The McCann perhaps being the one to have, the Range Rover definitely not. Terrible thing to a drive. I've been given the Audi Quattro, uh, a relatively high starting PI with the uh, Quattro, but I had made a half decent start in this. I was now just stuck in traffic as the McCann and the Impreza were battling one another coming across the start finish line. I had a good run, but nowhere to go with it. Not fancying three wide squished in the middle through turn one. <laughs> I decided to back out of all of that. And this is where the difficulty starts to set in for some of the faster cars. I was clearly quicker than the vehicles ahead, but it was taking time. I was losing time through these corners. A Camaro that had started further back was uh, making progress and caught up in the back of this group. Still, the McCann and Subaru fight side by side through the S's. I get a good run across the top of the crest, but nowhere to go. McCann defends to the inside. I am forced out wide by the Camaro, who then gets a mega run on the inside. I somehow found a lot more speed on the outside than uh, I was expecting to. McCann has nowhere to go. He's going to get boxed in between the Camaro and my Audi as we continue to be fighting our way down towards the S's. It's going to be side by side through here as a not the funnest place to be too wide. I can't hold it around the outside of the Subaru. Have to concede that position. Likewise, the McCann couldn't hold it around the outside of the Camaro as that uh, Chevy gets a lot of speed and uh, has a fire up the inside at one of the quickest corners on the circuit. We saw so many cars running wide, dipping wheels into the uh, grass. The Impreza pushed his luck. I would be able to get up the inside of the Impreza. Camaro couldn't quite stop in time. We all managed to uh, back up into one another almost. McCann getting to the inside and making the most of an opportunity to repass the Subaru. Not quite got the acceleration of my Audi with the Chevrolet able to come out of all of that on top. 
the front four continued to extend their lead while all of the craziness was going on further back. But they were now going to start fighting one another. Behind them in fifth was a Nissan 350Z that I had expected to come and catch up to this group, but it never really was able to make much progress. The uh, Firebird gets a good run on the McGann, and it is uh, to the inside. Not the easiest place to get overtakes done, admittedly, up the inside there. Often the car on the outside can carry good speed, as McGann is continuing to uh, fight back. But you do have to go a long way around the second part of the S's, and in the end, the Renault not quite got the speed. Interestingly, McGann, the only front-wheel drive car, I believe, in this field, has now slipped down to a uh, fourth place. The Firebird then on the tail of the Lance. Lancia, the Lancia a little bit too late on the turn in, and sure enough, the 037 takes a trip across the grass. The rally car able to uh, recover. I don't think he quite clonked the wall, able to uh, recover that, but now he's got a McGann to have to try and deal with. The Renault said putting up a very, very good fight, and the Renault would get the pass done as well on that uh, final hairpin. But still, the front four remained fairly close. The uh, wobbly Ford was <laughs> in the uh, midst of the action. The Audi Q7 was starting to create a little bit say a little bit, a lot bit of a train. The Q7 not being particularly fast, but good enough in a straight line to make it awkward and is massive, was uh, rather difficult to uh, get past. The fair lane was having issues with its suspension in that it would go round a corner, get itself stuck and unable to stop the car from steering left or right on the exit of turns, very nearly wiping out an Impreza. They all do survive it. Mini with a uh, big run on the inside as they're heading four wide almost into a corner. They do think better of all of that. Uh, the Mini being a uh, Forza edition car, again, something that could be randomly drawn for people. Was very quick through the corners, not so good down the straight. I, unfortunately, would be lag-murdered by the Q7. It was then my Quattro firing into the wall and dropping me down, and it gave me a lot of work to try and do in the Audi, while the Ford continued to try and fend off the uh, McCann, but you can see how much it moves on the suspension. It kind of looks like the suspension's collapsed on the fair lane, to be honest, when it goes round a corner. It is... Hor I must, it must be horrendously difficult to drive. It's horrendous to watch the damn thing. Terrifying to watch it. Uh, speaking of horrendous to drive, there are always those that are even more unlucky when it comes to uh, vehicles to be drawn. And a Mercedes G-Wagon always seems to like to uh, make its way into these races. You don't want a G-Wagon because not only is it awful, just about as awful as the Range Rover, it's also a really, really high PI vehicle, so it starts right at the very back. Only the Forza Edition Mini was a higher PI than the G-Wagon. And the G-Wagon is terrible. Also, ignore the slightly laggy, glitchy, weird replays going on, but you know. At least this one's bloody working. Uh, G-Wagon was uh, fighting, trying to find a way past the Range Rover. Actually does get a move completed at one of the fastest parts of the circuit. Not where I'd want to be going too wide in heavy, unwieldy SUVs, with the uh, G-Wagon often up onto uh, two wheels, and the Range Rover just not able to carry any corner speed whatsoever. Yeah, they were a fair way down. At the front of the field, and the Mercedes continued to lead the way, although he was now starting to come under increasing pressure from that uh, fiber. They began not really able to do too much about the uh, Mercedes, although disaster would strike for the two lead vehicles as they were heading down towards the uh, S's that just gets the tiniest of tags on the back of the Mercedes and uh, it's a complete wrong point and gets fired off into the tyre bundle. Now the 190E can get going again and the Firebird waits up for him. They've lost a fair bit of time to the lead two vehicles although didn't actually lose that much in terms of positions. They stayed ahead of the Nissan and this old big angry pack of, uh, of cars. The uh, McCann was living up to expectations, really, in terms of being the fastest of the SUVs. The McCann is actually a rather good car to drive. The Q7 was very big and very heavy and struggling quite a lot around here. The Jaguar F-Pace was horrendously unlucky. Uh, the Audi losing out to the Porsche. It wouldn't be long before the Q7 would start slipping back down the order. It, it tried to fought valiantly for a while, but uh, yeah, in the end it was just too big and too slow to uh, keep up. As I said, I had a lot of recovery work to try and do with my Quattro as an X5 will get himself in trouble and off visiting the grass. The lane was still wobbling around. It was a spectacular sight 
to a witness, although quite difficult to find a good place to try and get past it. You sort of hoped it wobbled itself off the road so that you could get an overtake done cleanly. The X5 would then struggle to get stopped into the hairpin. I'd dive up the inside of him and get another position, and the F-Pace would get itself caught on a tyre bundle. Yeah, the poor F-Pace got involved in a couple of crashes that wasn't his fault and then caught on a tyre bundle. It didn't go well for the poor Jag SUV, and the wobbly fair lane was also gradually falling his way through the order. As the race progressed, the field did start to spread out, as you would expect, with this kind of event, with cars that had had unlucky starts sort of trying to recover, but often running out of too much time. The 944 had taken a trip across the grass at uh, some point earlier on, and he was trying to work his way back up, got stuck in a Porsche duel, was really struggling to find a way past the uh, McCann. The 944 much better through these corners, as you can imagine, but the McCann was uh, not that bad and was a quicker car when it came to the straight, so it was a really tough time for the 944 to get into a position where he could try and overtake and putting a wheel on the grass isn't going to help. This final hairpin is a good bet to try and get passes done, but the McCann will go very, very defensive through there and keep the position, and then the McCann has the traction and the acceleration to uh, hold on to the place out the other side. When it came to further up the field, there was only really one car making large gains, and that was the Camaro. The uh, Nissan had uh, sort of got to the uh, fourth place, sadly the Mercedes 190E lagged out. The, the Nissan had got to fourth and was maybe ever so fractionally catching the Firebird, but not really able to make much gains. The Camaro had been putting the uh, Nissan under huge pressure and a small lockup of the brakes at a very, very critical part on the circuit is all it took to see the Nissan take a trip across the grass. I think almost every car took a trip through that bit of grass <laughs> at some point during this uh, particular race. It wasn't long then before the Camaro was on to the back of the Firebird as they crested the uh, hill right on the tail of that uh, Pontiac. As I said before, Sonoma not necessarily the easiest of tracks to overtake at. The Camaro has a big dive at the inside, but this corner is a little bit of an awkward one. If you, if you are on the outside, you keep things neat and tidy, you can often get a good run on the exit of the corner, and the Firebird is uh, trying to fight the point. In the end, though, sometimes you might just be better off letting a car that is, you know, clearly faster than you, letting that car go past don't cost yourself too much time. The Firebird put up a bit of a fight, but not enough to lose himself so much time. You know, you fight heavily through two or three corners, you can easily lose two or three seconds, and then you'd have the Nissan, for example, in this battle for company. So, yeah, sometimes it might not always be a bad idea to uh, let a faster car go so that you don't lose further places. One vehicle that we did expect to see make bigger progress through the field, the Forza Edition Mini, the highest PI car of the lot, started at the back of the field, worked its way up through the order very, very quickly, and then kind of hit a brick wall, unable to really make any gains on the uh, 350Z or any of the cars higher up. It was perhaps fractionally faster, but not enough to make up the uh, time deficit. It was good through the corners, but straight line speed was lacking. Still, the Camaro continued to pick off the vehicles at the front, up into third, not content to uh, settle for that one, went chasing after the uh, Lancia. Now, the Lancia was doing a good, a good job of holding on to that second place, but in the end, the Camaro just too fast. Uh, they both end up out a bit wide. The Lancia, once again, showing its uh, rally pedigree through there. The O37 would uh, fall back. However, it didn't give the Camaro that long to try and chase down the McGann. You can see the gap that the McGann did have over the rest of the field. As I said, you know, the Lancia did slightly inherit second when the Mercedes and uh, Firebird tangled, but it uh, did a good job of holding on and you know, fending off from that Firebird through a lot of the mid-race. For three or four laps, I think, the Porsches were continuing to fight with one another. Up ahead, the Subaru was another car having a very, very lonely end of race. The McCann was a little bit slow through the uh, fast, fast right-hander, and that gave the 944 an opportunity, an opportunity that he'd been looking for uh, a number of laps. Does get the car to the inside at the hairpin, but in doing so, runs a little bit wide on the exit, and then comes that McCann's acceleration. The traction from the all-wheel drive SUV, but it wasn't going to be quite enough to hold on to that position. And in all of their fighting, it allowed my Quattro to catch up, and it was going to be a uh, final lap battle to uh, see which one of us 
would be able to come out on top. With the 944 being the better handling of the cars, the McCann fastest in a straight line, and my Quattro perhaps the best overall, but needing to try and find track position. And I needed to try and find track position against two cars that were fighting. Also, the Quattro, while nowhere near as bad as the Fairlane or a Delta S4 that was in the race, still quite wobbly on its old suspension and could get into a little bit of trouble. McCann had a look at getting a pass done, couldn't do anything. And the problem is, when you have these attempts at passes that don't quite come off, you end up slowing yourself down. That gives me a big opportunity in the Quattro as we run towards the S's. It's the 944 on a slightly wonky line that uh, gets himself in trouble. The McCann would have slot back into line behind my Quattro. I have to kind of brave around the outside of things going slightly wrong for the 944, but would get the Quattro ahead of the pair of them as we headed down towards that uh, final, final corner, and that would be uh, the order we finished in. At the front, despite a bit of a uh, wobble across the grass on the final lap, the McGann would hold on to a take victory, but only just two or three more corners, and the Camaro may well have got it as they headed down towards that uh, start finish line. Yeah, McGann, only front wheel drive car in the race. <laughs> front wheel drive would take victory. Camaro ran out of laps, but was catching quick was catching very quick towards the end of that uh, that race but yeah certainly spectacular nevertheless in the end further back the Lancia was just not quite able to fend off that uh, that firebird but neither third or fourth were ever really caught that much by the uh, Nissan Perhaps a, a bigger surprise for me. In many ways, I was expecting the 350Z to catch up to these guys. The Firebird also having a very near miss, very near big moment around that uh, horrendously fast corner. As I said, I think every car touched the grass at some point around there, trying to uh, carry a little bit too much speed. The Lancia had a go into the final hairpin. In the end, the Firebird just too much in terms of straight line speed. So Pontiac in third ahead of the Lancia in fourth. You know, with the exception of the Camaro, uh, the top five were largely cars with relatively low PI in this race. The higher PI cars were just unable to uh, often make their way through the order. Also, some of the higher PI cars were things like the Mercedes G-Wagon, things like this Lancia Delta S4 with the wibbly and wobbliest of suspension. Honestly, who had the worst do job with suspension-wise is up for much debate between the Thunderbolt, the G-Wagon, the Delta S4, and the horrendous Land Rover. They were all <laughs> having their own <laughs> various issues. I mean, this was the fight down for about 16th place on the final lap between the Delta S4. The Delta had had three or four spins across the track because... When you take corners at high speeds, sometimes, and the Fairlane did a similar thing, sometimes the cars would get stuck with a wheel up in the air and you just lost control of your steering. Your car was just going to go left or right. You can actually see the amount the Fairlane moves and dives around. It's a couple of times the Fairlane actually bunny hopped its way through some of these uh, some of these corners. The G-Wagon was desperately trying to keep ahead of the Lancia, but uh, while its suspension might be slightly better in some ways, slightly worse in uh, others. We saw the G-Wagon up on two wheels around some fast corners. At the end, it just doesn't have the grip to uh, compete with that Lancia up ahead. The Q7 was trying to fend off from the Fairlane, but uh, unfortunately, Audi's lag would put the Ford in the wall, and that would give the Lancia a position uh, just on the line, as uh, the G-Wagon wouldn't quite be able to beat the Fairlane in all of that. Uh, the Land Rover was miles behind in last as well. The Land Rover did not have, did not have a good day, so... <laughs> There we go. That was some some lucky dip racing. It is really very, very good fun. I was perhaps quite surprised by some of the, the performances with the low PI cars. The likes of the Gand, the likes of the Lancia 037 really did make it. Even the Firebird Trans Am, for a, for, to an extent, were very, very low PI cars. Things like my Audi Quattro did get tangled up in uh, well, tangled up in a little bit of a crash. Super Impreza, though, uh, was running in clean air for a lot of time. The Forza Edition Mini was running in clean air for a lot of time and not really able to make much progress on those front-running cars. The size of the gap early on and the struggles we got stuck in traffic meant that we just couldn't catch the cars further up. So, yeah, made for made for some exciting, made for some interesting interesting racing. And as ever, you get given a car, you never know what it's going to be. And you'll perhaps be driving something that, uh, that you haven't before. Some people probably weren't enjoying their cars, like the Thunderbolt, for example, with their <laughs> wobbly suspension. 
But yeah, it's certainly made for a spectacle. Now, unfortunately, as I said at the start, there was a second race we did. We did a B-Class Lucky Dip race at Suzuka that was f even better than we had at Sonoma. I was going to say far better than Sonoma. Sonoma was a good race. The Suzuka race was utterly incredible, unfortunately. That replay's broken. Invalid save data and nobody can load it. So, can't do anything with that. We're definitely going to go back, though, and do some more Lucky Dip racing at, uh, at a later date when replays are more stable because it is fantastic fun and you get some really interesting, interesting matchups and interesting cars having to try and carve their way through the field. That, though, is going to be it from me. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, uh, goodbye.